It is with great pleasure that I introduce and invite up to the stage to close our conference. Teacher, supervisor, mentor, master clinician, and friend, Dr. Merle Jordan. It's been wonderful to be here, and I want to thank a few people to begin with. I want to thank the speakers for sharing your innermost private dimensions of your life, as well as your intellectual gifts on how you apply your spirituality to your therapeutic practice. I commend you for the courage of your authenticity and your insights about applying spirituality to psychotherapy. I also would like to salute the respondents and the uh, mediators uh, for their probing for further understandings and interpretation of the application of spirituality to psychotherapy. And then on behalf of everybody, George, uh, we want to thank you as the executive director of the Danielson Institute, whose creative ideas for this conference have been lived out in such challenging and exciting ways. And we appreciate the way in which you have handled all of this. And then to your staff, some of whom are still outside working, but we want to uh, also note how much of the detailed um, process of implementing and carrying out the hundreds of uh, facets of this gathering. To their thoughtful to the thoughtful givers, to the Jordan Fund, as well as to the other organizations that have uh, underwritten this uh, incredible experience, we are very grateful for your support and for all that you have provided for the fund and for this kind of very exciting conference. Now, I, in the closing, I want to add my own perspective uh, because I have a unique perspective on the integration of uh, psychology and spirituality. Um, and I realize that there aren't many people in the field who would agree with me, except for some of my former students who are here. <laughs> My fundamental thesis is this. All psychotherapy is really clinical theology. One's understanding of the depth and facets of another's life is best held in the context of the person's story and struggle being seen as implicit um, internal drama. Now this begins with the work of an Austrian analyst, um, Wilfried Daim, who out of his studies came to the belief, and he was focusing mainly at that time on neurotics, but in the belief that all people come to their struggles by making uh, an ultimate power out of some uh, experience they've had in human relationships. And certainly, uh, speakers 
Dr. Wallen in particular really highlighted how true that was in his life experience. Um, the other dimension of this that uh, is uh, very significant for me to the double idolatry is not only do we make of internal objects like parents of the past that are interjected, do we make them the absolute authority, but we then find ways, I'm not saying conscious, but we find ways of surviving in the kingdom or rule or under the rule of those false dominant authorities. And the second idolatry is uh, really how do you become your own savior living with harsh and cruel or perhaps distant and passive authorities. And so we all learn ways of survival. Um, I grew up in a family in which when I was six, I stood in the kitchen of our home in South Portland, Maine. And my mother said to me with tears coming down and over, over her face and with great emotional struggle, I need you to know that when you were just a baby, your birth mother died. I think I am your mother, but I'm afraid your knowing about your other mother will mean that you won't want me as your mother. My world went just like that. But I also was very sensitive to the fact that she was so upset and anxious about my taking care of her and continuing to love her that I immediately went to the reassurance of, of course I love you and you are my mother. Um, Never again in my childhood with either my stepmother or my father did I ever ask a single question. It didn't feel safe. I had one person, a cousin of mine, who would tell me stories such as she remembered my birth mother and my father having the radio on in the kitchen and they're dancing. And she would tell about how she would go with my mother to the theater in Portland, Maine, and enjoy stage shows, and so, so on. And so in about two or three weeks, I am flying out to San Diego, where this cousin now lives, who is celebrating her 95th birthday. And I'm going because she is so special as the one link to my mother. And would you believe, with all the therapy I've had, and I've been in lots of therapy, and all kinds of supervision, et cetera. I'm still in individual and group therapy. I am finally learning that I don't have to give up being who I really am in order to survive in this world. It has been difficult for me to perceive that this world is a place in which I am safe to really be me and to go on in a constructive way. Some of you know that my favorite way of teaching is to tell a story. And so I'm going to make the final comments a story that comes from Henry Nowen and has been adapted by Wayne Dyer. It goes like this. Imagine the following scene, if you will. Two babies are in utero confined to the wall of their mother's womb, and they are having a conversation. For the sake of clarity, we'll call one ego and one spirit. Spirit says to ego, I know you're going to find this difficult to accept, but I truly believe there is a life hereafter. <laughs> ego responds, don't be ridiculous. Look around you. This is all there is. 
why must you always be thinking about something beyond reality? Accept your lot in life. Make yourself comfortable and forget about all this life after birth nonsense. <laughs> so spirit quiets down for a while. But her inner voice won't allow her to remain silent any longer. Ego. Now don't get mad, but I have something else to say. I also believe there is a mother. A mother, ego guffaws. How can you be so absurd? You've never seen a mother. Why can't you accept that this is all there is? The idea of a mother is crazy. You have, all you have is being here alone with me. This is your reality. Now grab hold of that cord. Go into your corner and stop being so silly. Trust me, there is no mother. So spirit reluctantly stops your conversation with ego, but soon her restlessness gets the better of her. Ego, she implores, please just listen to me without rejecting my ideas. Somehow I think these constant pressures we both feel, these movements that make us so uncomfortable sometimes, that continually, continual repositioning and all of that closing in that seems to be taking place as we are growing is getting us ready for a place of glowing light and we will experience it very soon. <laughs> now I know you are absolutely insane, says ego <laughs> to spirit. All you've ever known is darkness. You've never seen light. How can you even contemplate such an idea? Those movements and pressures you feel are your reality. You are a distinct, separate being. This is your journey. Darkness and pressures and a closed-in feeling are what life is all about. You'll have to light it as long as you live. You'll have to fight it as long as you live. Now grab your cord and please stay still. So spirit relaxes just for a while. But finally, she can contain herself again no longer. Ego, I have only one more thing to say, and then I'll never bother you again. Go ahead, Ego says impatiently. I believe all of these pressures and all of this discomfort is not only going to bring us to a new celestial light, but when we experience it, we are going to meet mother face to face and know an ecstasy that is beyond anything we have ever experienced up until now. You are really crazy, spirit. Now I'm truly convinced of it. And the story simply encourages all of us to keep that faith in the unseen and yet for some of us the experienced reality of a love that stands at the heart of the meaning of the universe and of human life. That that love which is here to sustain us also is there to be for us after we move through death to the life beyond. May you know that love and that light and may you live with its overwhelming joy. Amen.